How does air assault work? And is it even still relevant in modern warfare? Well, I'm gonna answer that question, but driving out to Fort Campbell to research this story on my own dime wasn't cheap. So give me two minutes to pay the bills here. This video is sponsored by Helix Sleep. Hey, it's me, Ryan Macbeth, and I'm wearing a different shirt now. Listen, click the link in the description below or go to helixsleep.com slash Ryan Macbeth to get 20% off your new mattress plus two free pillows. Let me, let, me take a, let me take you on a walk here. A lot of people think I live in here, but that's just my spare bedroom. This is my real bedroom, and this back here is my new Helix mattress. I've had it for a couple of weeks now. Helix mattresses are assembled in America at Helix's Arizona facility. And this is pretty darn important to me because I prefer to buy products that are assembled in America. Now, the other thing I like is that this mattress is fiberglass free. I didn't know this, but a lot of mattresses have fiberglass embedded in them as a flame retardant. And if you rip that mattress, it can actually escape into the air and you do not want to be breathing that stuff in. So Helix is fiberglass free. And one other neat thing is that I've been waking up with less back pain since I got this mattress. You really don't appreciate how much a good mattress can make a difference in the quality of sleep and how you feel when you wake up, especially as you get older. Okay, come back with me in the other room. I want to show you the Helix Sleep Quiz where they customize your mattress for you and your partner. Everybody sleeps differently. In my case, I'm one sleeper. I'm 47, 5'9", 224, and I'm a back sleeper. And what Helix selected for my sleeping style and body type was the Helix Dawn Lux. And I got the cooling cover. Helix Sleep delivers the mattress right to your door with free shipping in the U.S. The mattress comes rolled up in a box, and I knew this technology existed, but it was neat seeing it in action. When you take the mattress out of the box, it inflates itself. If you're nervous about buying a mattress online, Helix has a 100-night sleep trial, so you get three months to see if you love it. And Helix is a 10-year warranty, flexible payment plans, and financing options. So you're never more than a click away from a great night's sleep. So go to helix.com slash Ryan Macbeth to get 20% off plus two free pillows. Now let's talk about air assault. On February 24th, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced a special military operation against Ukraine. Russian VDV airborne forces performed an air assault on the Hostomel airport, which was just a few miles northwest of the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. The attack was a disaster. The VDV lost several helicopters during the assault. They couldn't resupply their troops, and eventually the runways were turned to rubble by Ukrainian artillery. The airport was finally taken by ground assault, but its usefulness as a logistics hub was denied to Russian forces. Now, the VDV was Russia's premier airborne force. If they couldn't do this, what does that say about the relevance of America's air assault capabilities? It may be possible to lift a decisive force by helicopter in a coin or counterinsurgency environment, but in a LISCO or large-scale combat operations environment, I don't know. Helicopters are pretty delicate machines, and the surface-to-air missile threat that travels at Mach 4 will always be able to outrun a helicopter. What chance would the 101st Airborne stand against modern surface-to-air missiles? Why are we spending all this money doing dangerous things like flying at night to support the concept of vertical envelopment, which certainly seems outdated? So I traveled to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, home of the 101st Airborne, the world's only division that is solely dedicated to air assault operations. And what I saw really opened my eyes. Now a bit about the 101st Airborne. This division's lineage goes all the way back to World War II. When the unit was formed, its first commander, William C. Lee, said that the unit had no history, but it had a rendezvous with destiny. They probably have the most recognizable patch in the history of the U.S. Army, the Screaming Eagle. You've probably seen this patch if you've watched The Longest Day, Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, A Bridge Too Far, and Hamburger Hill. Paratroopers from the 101st even protected African-American students from violence when Arkansas refused to desegregate their public schools in 1957. The 101st Airborne was initially an airborne unit, meaning they reached their objective by glider or by parachute. But the end of World War II saw a shift in thinking away from airborne operations toward a future where wars would be fought in Europe with heavy armor and nuclear weapons. Vietnam changed all of that. The U.S. realized that it needed light units to take the fight to the Viet Cong. But fighting is nothing without sustainment. So the units would travel, fight, and be sustained by helicopter. 
They called this air mobile operations and its doctrine was pioneered by the 1st Cavalry Division that we see in that We Were Soldiers movie. The 101st Airborne was designated as an air mobile unit and they distinguished themselves in Vietnam as sort of a 911 response force. They fought in every area of the conflict, earning them the nickname the Nomads of Vietnam. By 1974, the 101st had gotten a hang of this air mobile thing and it became their specialty. They were redesignated as America's only air assault division. They formed an air assault school at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and they honed their craft. On August 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein's Iraqi army invaded Kuwait, and the 101st Airborne was part of the coalition response. Remember, the 101st Airborne moves and fights by helicopter. At the time, it had two attack helicopter battalions worth of Apaches and 180 tow anti-tank missiles mounted on Humvees. These Humvees were highly mobile across the desert, and they outranged the guns of the Iraqi armor. And these Humvees could even be moved by helicopter. This ability to move an anti-tank force anywhere they wanted was a capability that only the 101st had when defending Saudi Arabia. It was the 101st Airborne Apaches that fired the first shots of the war on January 17, 1991, when Apache helicopters attacked an Iraqi radar early warning site. They opened the door for the coalition air war. The coalition pounded Iraqi defenses for six weeks, and then the ground war began. The 1st Brigade of the 101st Airborne and a battalion from 2nd Brigade left their staging area via helicopter and established a forward operating base called Forward Operating Base Cobra, 94 miles inside of Iraq. The 101st then turned FOB Cobra into a FARP, or Forward Arming and Refueling Point. Think of it like a mobile gas station for rearming and refueling helicopters. FOB Cobra was then used by 3rd Brigade of the 101st Airborne to rearm and refuel as it leapfrogged 155 miles ahead to Highway 8 to cut off the Iraqi city of Basra from the Iraqi city of Baghdad. That's right, the 101st moved an entire brigade 155 miles into Iraq and the Iraqis couldn't do a thing about it. The doctrine of air assault had been validated, but is it still valid today? After my time with the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell, yeah, yeah it is. So why did Russia attack Hosmal Airport at dawn? Well, they did that because they have very little experience in flying at night. Russia also failed to bring any heavy artillery with them. The 101st not only practices slinging their artillery under their helicopters, they also practice a technique known as gun raids. And when I heard the term gun raid, I thought that meant the 101st could move artillery by helicopter closer to the front line. And yeah, they can, if they want to. They can also move artillery by helicopter deep into enemy territory either to support a raid or the artillery is the raid. So that means the 101st can rig their artillery, fly it into enemy territory, perform a night fire mission, rig it again in the dark while wearing night vision, and fly back out again, all during one period of darkness. Yeah, and the more time I spent with the 101st, the more I realized that these guys are unique in the US Army. If you consider the 82nd Airborne to be a scalpel and something like the 1st Armored Division to be a sledgehammer, the 101st Airborne is more like a Gerber multi-tool. They can fly to the objective by helicopter. They can also sling load or carry infantry squad vehicles that can give them extended range. Or fly, then drive, or fly, then walk. It's really a unique capability. Now, you might have served in the military and done a couple of helicopter insertions. I know I have. So you might wonder, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal, and the one thing that the 101st does better than anybody, is sustainment. Anybody with helicopters can move people by helicopters. It's not trivial, but you can do it. But the 101st can do it at scale and continue to do it for one night, two nights, three nights, and on and on and on and bring with them all of their artillery and even their engineers. The exercise I attended, Operation Lethal Eagle 3, is a 21-day exercise. I arrived on day 17 and the 101st was still pedaled to the freaking floor running air missions. It all starts with Air Assault School, which is run by the 101st. It's a school that many people call the 10 toughest days in the Army. And while some of it is physical, a good portion of it is mental. 
The school teaches the basics of aerosol operations, like how to plan air movements and how to do cool guy stuff like repelling. But the most important component is sling loading because that's how you sustain. You can actually sling supplies underneath your helicopters and use those to supply your troops in the field. As Russia realized at Hasanol Airport, you have to do more than just get your troops there. You need to supply them as well. And you can sling a heck of a lot more stuff under the helicopter than you can put inside of it. In fact, there are sections of the school that just concentrate on figuring out how to sling different loads, everything from generators to new kinds of vehicles. Now, the 101st contains three infantry brigades, a sustainment brigade, a division artillery brigade, a headquarters element, and then the largest aviation brigade in the Army. Now, let me talk about this aviation brigade for a moment. The aviation brigade contains 48 Apache attack helicopters, 8 Gray Eagle drones, 12 Shadow drones, 38 Black Hawk utility helicopters, 24 Chinook medium lift helicopters, and 15 Medevac Black Hawks. It's enough to move an entire brigade in 96 hours. That means 5,000 or so troops anywhere and sustain them. The average Black Hawk company contains 10 UH-60 helicopters split into two platoons of five helicopters each. Each platoon has 10 pilots and roughly the same number of maintainers. You know the crew chiefs that you sit in the back of the helicopter helping load and unload the bird or man the door guns? Those crew chiefs hold the MOS, or Military Occupational Specialty, of 15 Tango on the Black Hawks or 15 Uniform on the Chinooks. Every helicopter company has a maintainer company, and only the best maintainers that volunteer to fly are actually moved from the maintenance company to the aviation companies to be crew chiefs on those helicopters. And piloting isn't exactly an easy job either. There's a myth in the Army that warrant officers have these really easy jobs, but that isn't true in aviation. Quick note, in 1949, the Army wisely decided that you didn't need a college degree to be a pilot. Most pilots were made warrant officers, which are above enlisted soldiers, but below commissioned officers. The whole idea is that these warrant officers don't need to worry about officer strategy and planning responsibilities. Their only job is to be the best darn pilot they can be. All they do is fly and get better at their craft. This is paramount when you're lifting a giant M777 howitzer and the load is oscillating and the bird is swaying back and forth like a pirate ship. Pilots also have to understand weather, rain and wind can affect the way the helicopter handles, excessive heat can make the air thinner and harder to carry heavy loads, even the phase of the moon is important to know because moonlight can illuminate your bird. After speaking with the aviators, the one thing that I took away was humility. You have to know every single system on that bird, every fuel and hydraulic line, and the exact procedures to follow if something goes wrong. Flying a helicopter at night isn't like flying a jet fighter where you're at 35,000 feet and you have time to diagnose the problem or get help from the ground. You need to know exactly what to do in an emergency because you're 200 feet from the ground and you're responsible for the lives of the soldiers in back. Now let's talk about these soldiers in back. On the infantry side, a typical brigade in the 101st Airborne contains three infantry battalions, a cavalry squadron, an artillery battalion equipped with a mix of 105 and 155 millimeter guns, a battalion of engineers, and a sport battalion. In my case, I was embedded with 3rd Brigade 187th Infantry, the famous Rockassons, and I have to spend a moment speaking about them. This is a very unique unit. Uh, it wasn't actually attached to the 101st during World War II. Instead, it came from the Pacific Theater, and it was made part of the 101st Airborne in 1955. The Rakasans got their name when they served on occupation duty in Japan after World War II. A translator didn't know the Japanese word for parachute when explaining what they did, so he literally called them falling down umbrella men. Literally, Rakasans. The name stuck. And the Rakasan Tori was adapted from the gates that mark Japanese Shinto shrines. Today, the Tories mark Rakasan country, which, if you're the adversary, is not a place you want to be. The Rakasans probably rivaled the Marine Corps in their level of unit pride. In fact, they probably surpassed the Marine Corps. Not even Marines put up Eagle Globe and anchors everywhere they go. The Rakasans put up Tories everywhere. And where they go is wherever the heck they want to go. Now, when you perform an aerosol operation, 
there are quite a few factors you need to take into consideration. There's typically a 72 hour planning window. Everything centers off the ground tactical plan. This answers the question of what the unit on the ground intends to accomplish. Then the plan gets sent to the aviation brigade, which basically acts as customer service. It's their job to figure out how to support the mission. The aviation brigade may have to start movement or create FARPs, these forward arming and refueling points that I talked about earlier from the first Gulf War. They may also consider filling up Chinooks with gas for fat cow operations, where Chinooks are loaded with fuel and essentially become mobile gas stations. The aviation brigade also develops the air movement plan. They figure out how they're going to get to the fight and what they'll do after they drop off the troops. Will they fly back to the pickup zone and get more troops or will they land nearby and prepare for casualty evacuation or CASEVAC? Meanwhile, ground units are finalizing the ground tactical plan, completing the loading plan and the staging plan. These parts are just as important as the ground tactical plan. Air assault is really a game of gas. Every second that helicopters on the ground picking up troops or supplies is one less second that they can be in the air. Small problems on the front end can cause a compounding effect later. So special teams are created to make sure the PZ or pickup zone can handle any problems such as loads that aren't rigged right or helicopters that break down in the middle of picking up troops. Rehearsals are a big part of this as well. Troops practice entering and exiting the helicopter since that's the most dangerous and critical part of the loading process. And for loading, the standard to do so at night is no more than five minutes. The assault force also has to develop a cherry and ice plan on the LZ or landing zone. Now, I'm sure you've heard the term hot LZ or cold LZ. Well, a hot LZ or landing zone is defined as a landing zone that is expected to receive fire. A cold LZ is not expected to receive fire. So cherry or ice is a representation of risk. If the LZ is cherry, that means it's too dangerous to land. The unit will divert to an alternate landing zone or perhaps loiter airborne to wait for a change in conditions or even logger where we'll just land the birds and just wait. Ice means that the landing zone is below the acceptable risk criteria for landing, even if the LZ is hot. And it's important for everyone to know what to do in the event of either cherry or ice circumstance. Now, before the main body moves, the scouts are inserted, usually 24 to 48 hours before the main body. The scouts will perform multiple fake insertions, meaning the choppers will pretend to land in many different places before actually offloading the scouts. Then they may perform a few more fake insertions afterward to complete the ruse. The scouts will move toward the objective and get eyes on target. 101st may even allocate drones to overwatch the target if it's safe to do so. Now you may wonder why human scouts are used when drones are so prevalent, and the reason is persistence. Drones are very useful tools, but they have limited endurance. Scouts can sit in a hide site and watch a target for days. So scouts are a very important part of the surveillance equation. And they carry their own small drones like the Black Hornet in case they need to see over the next hill. After the scouts come the pathfinders. The pathfinders move in 8 to 24 hours before the main body. These are elite air assault soldiers who have expertise in setting up landing zones. Slopes of over 15 degrees are a no-go for helicopter landings. So are obstacles like trees or craters or power lines. So it's the Pathfinder's job to make sure the LZ is safe and mark any dangerous obstacles. Now before the main body moves, the planners split their units into chalks, serials, and lifts. Chalks are the individual assignments to each helicopter. It harkens back to the early days of air assault operations where loads were identified with different colors of chalk. Serials are collections of chalk, so there might be four or five helicopters in one serial. And lifts are groups of serials, which makes one complete turn out to and back from the landing zone. You designate who goes on what serial, chalk, and lift, because if you need 20 helicopters to carry all of your troops, but you only have room for five helicopters in the landing zone, they all can't show up at the same time. Think of uh, the planning like a ballet that runs on aviation gas. Finally, the main body is picked up and flies to the landing zone, and there is a science to that as well. You may choose to exit the helicopter on one side, which takes longer, but provides the greatest firepower toward the enemy, 
or on both sides, which is faster but not as good for massing fires. Then the soldiers move toward their objective and they take it. So now, let me actually take you on the mission. Everybody get out your notepads and listen up. All right, situation. Enemy forces continue to perform delaying actions in Zarnov Oblast. Weather for the mission is partially cloudy with a high of 80 degrees and a low of 64 degrees. Tonight's moon is a waxing crescent with 22% illumination. Enemy forces consist of a platoon from the 75th Motor Rifle Regiment with added support from an unknown anti-aircraft missile system. The enemy's most likely course of action is to hold the town of Svetlava and continue to deny access to the Svetlava Bridge over the Lazora River. Friendly forces consist of Company A, 1187 as the main assault and pathfinder element, 1st Platoon, Troop uh, Charlie, 133 Cavalry for scouting, Alpha and Bravo Company, 6 101st Aviation, provides 20 Blackhawks for lift and Kazovac support, and Company A, 1101, provides attack support. Most of the civilians have led the town, but intel suggests that some remain in the town's church, which has been handing out humanitarian assistance to those who can't leave, so take special care to avoid targeting the church. When in doubt, follow your standard rules of engagement. Mission. Alpha Company, first the 187th attacks Svetlava and seizes Svetlava Bridge intact. Execution. First platoon, Troop Charlie, 133 Cavalry, departs Fob Eagle for LZ Radiant and secures objectives Barley, Wheat, and Rye. Pathfinder teams depart Fob Eagle and evaluate LZ Stellar and LZ Odyssey for landing. Company A, 1101, departs Fob Eagle and attacks objective Oak and Maple, remaining on station for the main attack. Alpha Company, first the 187th, departs Fob Eagle and assaults LZ Stellar, taking objectives Maple and Oak. Four transport ships will logger at LZ Radiant to provide Kazovac. Once Objective Oak is taken, Objective Maple will be reinforced for counterattack. Service and support. Supplies will be coordinated through the support brigade. Casualties will be collected at LZ Stellar. Enemy prisoners of war will be held at Objective Oak until they can be moved to LZ Mirage for evac. LZ Mirage will be used as a casualty collection point after Objective Oak is taken. Command and signal. All radio call signs per standard operating procedure. And now, the planning process begins. The S3 or Operation Staff Shop, 1st the 187th Infantry, begin their planning process. They also start coordinating with the Aviation Brigade to make sure the crews have enough rest to complete the mission and all the airframes are available for the operation. The air movement plan is constructed. Chalks and cereals are created for the scouts who will go in first and the pathfinders who will go in afterwards. Meanwhile, Alpha Company 1187 Infantry is rehearsing. They build a small model of the town, Objective Oak, and the hill to the northeast, Objective Maple. They also come up with a plan to take Objective Maple and use it as a mortar and machine gun position. It's key terrain, and it can be used to fire down the road, which is the most likely avenue of counterattack, or used to support the assault on Objective Oak. The scouts leave Fob Eagle under cover of darkness. After performing several false insertions, they land at LZ Radiant and move to Overwatch Objective Oak. The scouts at Objective Wheat and Rye spot a mechanized platoon of three BMPs and a dozen dismounted infantry. A surface-to-air missile system sits watching in the distance on the hill at Objective Maple. The Pathfinders arrive via helicopter at LZ Odyssey. They survey the LZ and remain in the forest, visually surveying LZ Stellar to the north. The Apaches arrive and they perform seed or suppression of enemy air defenses. Hovering slightly over the treetops by LZ Odyssey, they attack and destroy the missile system at Objective Maple. Yes, right. Okay, we got a low ball box. All right. Checking. All right, tell them uh, shot out and fire. Shot out. Firing, yep. Where's that? That's a good missile. The Apaches then turn their guns toward the town, mindful of the church and any civilians present, and they attack and destroy the enemy BMPs with cannon fire. The surviving enemy soldiers scatter into the town. It's going to take infantry to dig them out. As this is happening, back at Fob Eagle, Alpha Company, first the 187th, is boarding. They come in at night, five chalks to a lift. 
One helicopter experiences a mechanical failure and moves itself to the far end of the PZ. It's okay, they plan for this with a bump plan. The squad that was supposed to go on that down bird gets moved to another and the pickups continue. As the Blackhawks travel, the Apaches stay on station, hunting down individual enemy soldiers with cannon fire wherever they can. The first lift hits LZ Stellar. They exit out one side, moving up to and securing Objective Maple. More lifts pour in, and Alpha Company consolidates on Objective Maple. With the last lift complete, a platoon of Blackhawks loggers at LZ Radiant to Kazavak any wounded. Alpha Company leaves a weapon squad and a mortar team on Objective Maple as they enter the town. The fighting is house to house. But the enemy soon realizes that their position is untenable and they rapidly surrender. Objective Oak is secure, and with it, the main bridge across the Lizoka River. Now, not all missions are as successful as that one. Things go wrong, people get lost, but the 101st has some highly motivated soldiers. They usually figure it out. You know, every time I interview people for a video, I always ask the question, what makes a good soldier? When I asked parachute riggers what makes a good rigger, they said, oh, attention to detail. When I asked what makes a good sniper, they said resilience. But when I asked what makes a good soldier in the 101st Airborne, the word courage kept popping up. And it seems so odd because of course you're supposed to have courage. But this is different. You know, it's one thing to strap on a javelin missile and a 100 pound rucksack and ride in a machine that's trying to vibrate itself apart. But it's quite another thing entirely to step off that bird and into the night where the monsters lurk, unless you're braver than the monster. And when you think about it, we all get scared once that first round flies by your head, but training is the bridge over the chasm between scared and brave. And that's why the 101st Airborne trains so much at night. While the rest of us are sleeping, they're working to make the gap between scared and brave as narrow as possible. I was the first YouTuber ever invited to Fort Campbell to cover a story, and I am grateful to the following people who made this happen. To start, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Hoffler, Public Affairs Officer for the 101st Airborne, and Captain Trayvon Andrews, Public Affairs Officer for the Rockasson Brigade. I'd also like to thank Captain Jonathan McLeroy, Commander of the 101st Airborne's Air Assault School, and Sergeant First Class Matthew T. Conrad, Air Assault Chief Instructor, for their incredible technical expertise. I could not have done this without you gentlemen. Thank you to Captain Jacob O'Neill, a Chinook pilot, for the background in aviation, which was essential to this story. And thank you to Major Stephen Perry and Theodore DeLue for the background on planning missions, especially on how the 101st conducts gun raids. That is awesome and blew my mind. And finally, special thanks to Captain Ty Weaver and Staff Sergeant Long. They allowed me to accompany their scouts on a night mission uh, where I'm tripping all over the place trying to film and do night vision at the same time. I really appreciated that experience and this made the video so much better. Hey, if you like my rock out with your chalk out t-shirt, you can get one from Bunker Branding. Uh, everything goes to supporting awesome content like this. And thank you guys so much for watching. Oh, hi, America. It's me, Elon. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, go and get a Ryan McBeth t-shirt or hoodie from Bunker Branding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a high mouse shirt because it fires rockets, and rockets are pretty cool, just like me. Ha 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 ha, you fool. It is me, Mark Zuckerberg, from Facebook, and I will be the coolest once I get a Patriot shirt because the system is fully automated, just like me. <laughs> I'm going to get a U.S. Navy Department of the Boat People hoodie because I love their management style. Now, I will be cooler than any of you lads once I get my drone sweet drone shot. Now, I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because they blow up just like windows. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Oh, no. It is Steve Wozniak from uh, Apple. That's right, you nerds. You think you're the coolest for wearing a shirt? Well, Ryan McBeth is all the work. Yeah. So go buy a shirt from Bump branding to fund Ryan Beth to increase your understanding. Oh yeah!